This video demonstrates how nurses can use the HARP tool to predict the likelihood of functional decline during hospitalization of an older adult, and then target preventative strategies to mitigate that likelihood. The first patient that we're going to talk about this morning is Olive Jackson, and Mrs. Jackson is a 75-year-old female who was admitted last night through the emergency department with a diagnosis of pneumonia. Uh, she presented actually by her symptoms were that she was very weak and fatigued over the last couple of weeks. She's been self-limiting her activity. She's had almost no appetite, a non-productive cough. She thinks she's had a fever. Uh, but she hadn't actually taken her temperature. So yesterday, on the day of admission, she was unable to get out of bed and called 911 and was brought here by ambulance. In the emergency department, her SATs were low. She was started on oxygen uh, by nasal prongs. She has a history of osteoporosis and uh, uh, hypertension. She also has uh, fairly significant osteoarthritis, where she primarily takes either Tylenol or NSAIDs. Uh, sometimes she requires Vicodin for more significant pain. She's had stable vital signs. Uh, of note, she is widowed for five months, um, and her husband died suddenly, actually, um, of an acute MI. Recently, she's had to hire some help in the home, and Amelia actually has done uh, a fairly thorough functional assessment on her. It's Amelia. I'm back with Lily, my nursing student, and we were just wondering if we could go over your admission assessment with you. But first, we wanted to make sure that you're comfortable and you don't need anything before we get started. Yes, uh, but I, uh, uh, I'm going to need to go to the bathroom. Okay. Uh, we can get you up to the bathroom or we can get you a bedside commode. Uh, well, it, I, I, I rested so badly last night that if, I don't think I, I should get up. I, I, I'm afraid of falling. <laughs> Okay. Do you want to wait? We'll Could do we? the questions, and then we'll find, we'll get you up, or we'll help you use the bedpan. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well. We're just gonna sit down and talk to you for a few minutes. So well. after looking at your admission assessment, it looks like you noted that you're normally independent at home with eating, getting your food, going to the bathroom. Over the last two weeks since you've had the pneumonia and you haven't been feeling well, have you still been independent with these activities? Well, I've been pretty sick. Mm -hmm. At home, I, I I wasn't out of bed, you know, very much. I I got up, I I can go to the bathroom, and I, and you know my cane, I, I'm always really afraid it's going to slip and then I'll fall, and so but I just I hang on to the furniture and and, and, and the wall, okay, and I I can go back and forth, uh, but uh, I didn't, you know, wasn't I didn't feel like cooking or eating very much and I guess tea and toast maybe was was what I've had and and and, and what was whether there were that was getting the bathroom and what were the other things that you you, you wanted to just, talk we just about? wanted to know how you were getting around in your house and it sounds like you said you're having trouble using your cane that you usually yeah were using uh, uh, I do have some help. I, I have a, a, what she, a home health okay. worker who, but she's mostly done the, the, the heavy cleaning and, okay. and takes me places. So let's just talk about a few of the other activities that you might do at home. So it also looks like that normally you're able to use the telephone and handle your finances and take all of your medications at home yeah, that's, independently. That, that's okay. Is that correct? Yeah. That, okay, that, so you've just that, had somebody okay. helping you with transportation, some cooking, and um, recently shopping? Uh, yes, she went to the grocery store for me last okay. week because I, I, there was just no way. I mean, I've been, I just been in, I'm so tired. Okay. 
and being tired is part of of having the pneumonia too so that's normal with that so while we're while you're here we're gonna try to get you stronger so I'll talk to you more about that in a little bit um, just a couple of other questions um, it sounds like you might need some help at, when you go home so um, uh, I, do you feel like you would need more assistance in the home than you have right now I, I think because I you know I just I need rest I I'm just so tired. I I can't think about doing okay. anything. Mm -hmm. I, I think if could you help with it? I mean, yes. Well, we'll have a team meeting later, so we'll meet with physical therapy. We'll meet with social work and case management, and also your doctor, and we'll let them know what we've talked about. You know, from your admission assessment and from talking to you right now, and we'll probably suggest that you get some more help at home. So maybe mm -hmm. even have a nurse come see you or physical therapist and that sort of thing to help you navigate around your house better than than you are right now. Okay, okay so we'll we'll talk about that more after we have the meeting later. Mm -hmm. Another concern I have um, because you just stated that you were kind of scared of falling at home. Have you had any falls in the last six months? No. But not really, but I've had a couple of close calls in okay. one at the grocery store. I was really, I really thought I was going to fall. Now that's really yeah. scary. That must be hard for you right now. It, 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 it is. Uh, you know, I had an aunt who who fell and broke her broke her hip, and she never got up oh. anymore. Mm -hmm. And she's well, about, about the age I am now. Well, we're definitely going to focus on getting you stronger and getting you the help that you need, so we don't want you to fall. Thank and actually. You. This yellow armband that you have on right now is something that we use at the hospital here to indicate that you're at risk for falling. So it helps all Lily and myself and any other staff that comes by to know that you're at risk for falls. Oh. And the reason that we put this here is just to keep you safe so that we know we need to help you get in and out of bed and go to the bathroom and that sort of thing. That's a good idea. Okay, good. Yeah. So we have just a couple other questions. Are you are yes. you still feeling okay with going on? Yeah, yeah. Let's 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 get it done. <laughs> okay, great. So the next few questions we're going to ask you are questions to test your memory, and we ask these questions to everyone. They're really routine, and it's just so we can get a better idea of how to keep you safe while you're in the hospital, and also to see how you can learn best about your illness. So if we need to teach you things, it'll help us know what ways to teach you. So, what is the full date, including the day of the week? <sighs> I've been a little, you know, lost track of time a little bit. But uh, there was no calendar, and there was a calendar though where I came in April thirtieth, and it's it's two thousand and eight. <laughs> Great. And what's the day of the week? Uh, Wednesday. Okay, good. And can can you tell me the season? Oh, spring. <laughs> You're right. It is mm -hmm. spring. And what is the location we're in right now? A hospital. Which, which do you hospital? know the name of the hospital? UCSF. Very good. Yeah. Okay. What floor are we on? That I don't know. <laughs> okay, that's okay. And can you tell me the state and city and country we're in? Oh, in California, San Francisco, and the United States of America. <laughs> You're right. Very good. We just have a couple more questions and we'll be done. So we're almost there. Okay. Okay. The last part is I'm going to say three words to you. And I want you to repeat them back to me and then try to remember them because I'm going to ask you them again in a few minutes. Sound okay? Okay, so the words are hat, ball, and tree. Hat, ball, tree. Great. Okay, now can you spell the word world backwards? Oh, yeah, world. D, L, R, O, W. Is that right? Great. You're very good. Now, can you tell me the three words that I had you repeat? Oh, a minute ago. Um, mm -hmm. Hat. Tree. Uh, it's okay. I can't get to the third word. That's okay. That's no problem. 
You did that? great okay. with the questions. Absolutely. We just had a couple other questions um, I wanted to ask you about. Um, it sounds a little bit like you might have lost some interest in doing activities that you normally enjoy. Would you say that's true? Well, yeah. My, my husband did, you know, died five, mm -hmm. not very long ago, five months ago. And, and we did a lot of things together that you don't... Uh, well, I just... I just haven't gotten out as much, you know. I, mm -hmm. I mean, it's just different, and it's different. I, I just, yeah, I guess I don't do so many things. Do you, I, would you say you feel sad or blue often? Yeah, I think so. Okay. So I think it's good that we bring these things up because Lily and I can go talk to our geriatric nurse specialist and she can come talk with you and explore these feelings you're having a little bit more and we can talk to social work too to see if there's anything we can do to get you feeling better and feeling a little bit more motivated to get back to your normal activities. Does yeah. that sound good to you? Thank you. Okay, we'll definitely address that in our team meeting. So I saw Ms. Jackson this morning with my nursing student, Lily, and we completed the admission assessment and also did a hospital admission risk profile. And so she scored at intermediate risk for functional loss based on the fact that she was deficient in three of her IADLs. So she had reported to me that she's been in, unable to manage her transportation, unable to shop and do heavy housework and yard work. Um, another concern I have with Miss Jackson is that she requested to use the bathroom and when I offered to get her out of bed, she said that she was kind of afraid to get out of bed for fear of falling. So I'm a little bit worried that she's lost some strength and mobility and we may need to keep her on falls risk and maybe get physical therapy involved to get her stronger while she's here. I actually just stopped in to meet her and she did tell us that she's had two near misses with falls recently. Um, the last time she was actually able to get out of the house and go to the grocery store and in her home actually she has been having to use furniture and use the wall to get to the bathroom especially the last couple of weeks. My sense is is that she's been probably declining functionally since her husband's death. Um, it seems as though she's stopped going out and doing a lot of things that she had been doing and she now has this extreme fear of falling. She does use a cane at baseline, but I think she's feeling right now that the cane is not providing her enough support. Uh, unfortunately, living in San Francisco, she has stairs to get into the house also. So she's got, I think, 15 stairs to actually get into her house and another 10 stairs in order to get upstairs. So we were wondering, Dr. Bernacki, if you could tell us a little bit about what you think her plan is going to be. We saw an abnormality on her chest x-ray, and I think we may need to get a CT scan. We're going to review it with a radiologist, and then we'll know. I want to make sure she's well hydrated enough before she would go down for that CT. Um, I think she'll probably be here at least a couple more days, just because she's still requiring four liters of oxygen, and her stats are still mar saturations are still mar marginal. So... The other thing that really struck me about her is she seemed really flat. I don't know if you got that from her as well. She did seem that way to me also and expressed a little bit that she had lost some interest in activities that she used to enjoy. And when I asked her about that, um, she did say that she feels sad sometimes. So I don't know if that's recent or since her husband passed away. Mm -hmm. It's definitely worth exploring a little bit more with her. Do you know if she's had any support around that? You know, she's fairly isolated. She has a niece in the city, but mm -hmm. that's it. Okay. So she doesn't have children. We know of no other support system. Right, no, no children. children. Okay. So we definitely need to spend time determining what's going on there. If it's something that we can address now or if it's something that's more longstanding, but either way, we need to look into it. So would you be doing something like a geriatric depression screen for her? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And then uh, possibly tomorrow we can find out Absolutely. at rounds how she did and right. if there's anything that we can help do for her in the hospital. What do you think about contacting her niece? Is that something that one of us should try and do? If she agrees, absolutely. We need to make sure she's okay with that. And then, yes, we need to see how involved she is, if we can get her more involved. And if, there's real, if that's really the only support person, we need to broaden that. If she's afraid to get out of bed, 
how will she be getting up and down those stairs? So I would really like to know what physical and occupational therapy say, mm -hmm. whether it's just a fear or whether she can really do it. Um, and based on your assessment, she might need to go to a skilled nursing facility for a short period of time. Or perhaps possible. I can order equipment and home physical therapy, home mm -hmm. occupational therapy, and nursing if you feel it's indicated. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. During today's evaluation, I'll look at her bed mobility, how she's getting in and out of bed, her transfers, and take a look at her balance when she's up and standing. She might be at the point where she's more appropriate for a walker versus a cane, but that's something I'll definitely be looking at. I know in her admission assessment, she did identify that, her, that she was independent in her activities of daily living, so that she's been able to feed herself and um, toilet, but... You know, the thing that concerns me is the fact that she stayed, has been staying in bed. We also know that for the last two weeks, since she's probably been coming down with a pneumonia and has probably been already starting to have some decline, that she's not been eating well. So she told Amelia, really mm -hmm. basically, she's been living on tea and toast. Her arthritis, I think, has really been uh, worse since she's been limiting her activity. So I believe she's had more pain. It's harder for her to get in and out of um, like a cab and she wouldn't be able to get on the bus right now. So I think that's another issue is we need to really look and see if she needs a different pain regimen or if it's really basically because she hasn't been moving her joints. Well, there are things we can offer her in the community to to help her get through that. Right. I mean, that's what I was thinking. It, you know, when she recovered from this and kind of felt like maybe going out again, um, it sounds like she might benefit from maybe like some Tai Chi classes or something to kind of get her out and, yeah, you know, work on her emotions. Right. 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 I mean, I think it's up to us now to kind of get her back on her feet and keep her on her feet so that she actually does get back to whatever her baseline was, let's say, even six months ago, you know, prior to her husband passing away. And one of the things I would ask you, Brian and Mark, would be um, when you see her, we'd like to meet with you because we do want to complete the patient activity program form so that we can have that posted in her room. So if any of us come into her room, if I go in and see her later today and you've seen her, I'm going to know how much assistance she needs. So if she does need something, I'm going to know that I'm safe to get her up alone or I, do, I have to go get Amelia or Lily to help me do that. Definitely. And as well as when her niece comes in, she's going to be able to see, you know, what, what her aunt may need. As far as, uh, you know, transfers and amount of assistance, I think Mark and I will both work and assess uh, how much of assistance, how much trouble she's getting transferring not only from uh, the bed but into a chair or even a commode. So um, we'll definitely relay that information because that's definitely critical as far right. as her uh, ability to take care of herself. Right. Sure, after the eval of contact basis and tell you how much assistance she needs, I think it's important to get her up out of the bed multiple times through the day, have her ambulating to the restroom versus using the bed pan, I think it's me. Absolutely. Important Is steps to take. Is there a range how little we should get her up versus how much we should get her up so that we can maximize her as much as possible before she goes home? I think we want to err on getting her up multiple times throughout the day. Okay. I think more mm -hmm. is going to be better. Okay. So getting up, sitting in the chair for meals, ambulating to the restroom, things like that. And I think that would be important for all of us who go in to have the same message. Uh, that we're really concerned that she's going to continue to have decline and these are the things that she needs to do and how can we help her do it if she needs two people let's do that if we need minimal lift equipment or something else to make her feel safe um, we can um, we talked earlier about getting a low bed for her so that it might be easier for her to get in and out and she won't feel like she has to drop down so much to get to the floor so we can help with some of those things too and it really helps when the physician starts that off. Right. And we love how you do that with the patient. So when you say it first, doctor, and then we follow through, how important it is for her to get out of bed, to get her towards her, as, to maximize her strength in getting out of here. They just always, especially when they're of this generation, they love to hear it from the physician first. So let's summarize about Mrs. Jackson and what we're going to do for her. So the first thing is, uh, this morning, Brian and Mark, you're going to see her from a physical therapy, occupational therapy perspective, and we're going to put together an activity plan for her um, in conjunction with Amelia and Lily and myself. Uh, next, we're still waiting for some labs to come back, but um, she's going to continue to stay hydrated. The overall plan over the next couple of days is to see how she weans from oxygen because we'd like to actually have her off that before the time of discharge. We're also going to ask nutrition to come in and see her because we're a little bit worried about 
her lack of intake. Um, so we may do what Amelia suggested and have small meals, maybe have some protein supplements added to her diet. Uh, Lynn is going to contact her niece and we're hoping that she'll agree to have a sit down uh, together with her aunt um, to kind of discuss how things are really going at home and to make a plan for the future. Anne is going to uh, stay on board with being prepared to order home nursing, home social work, home physical therapy, and occupational therapy, depending. Um, we're going to talk to her about outside activities that she may want to participate in, senior uh, center activities, possibly some kind of exercise balance training like Tai Chi, um, which is you know offered all over the city here for seniors. Um, my Leaving anything out? All right, let's move on to the next patient. Functional decline actually is fairly common in older adults. It's been fairly well studied actually in the community and um, it's been found to be a very dynamic process. For example, Gill and colleagues in 2006 published a study where they followed patients 70 and over for five years longitudinally and looked at their ability to walk a half of a mile and take a flight of stairs. And what they found was that 60% uh, of patients or subjects over time experience the inability to climb the stairs and up to 83% of people at some point during that five years could not walk the half a mile. The, uh, many of them ultimately recovered, but they went through the cycle of uh, sometimes disabled, sometimes not. In the hospital setting, probably up to a third of older medically ill patients have been found to suffer some type of functional decline, meaning that they've lost the ability to do even one of their activities of daily living. Functional decline can occur with periods of bed rest or immobility even in young people and, and actually um, a lot of the studies up until recently have been done on much younger subjects, for example, uh, through uh, aerospace industry um, studying weightlessness and, you know, what happens with gravity. But in uh, older patients, the causes can be multifactorial. So there are certain changes that occur in our bodies as a normal course of aging that in and of themselves don't cause functional decline, but you couple that with having an acute illness such as pneumonia or a heart attack and the process of hospital care. So low mobility states, people are too fatigued because they're acutely ill. So you put those together on top of those changes that occur with aging and you end up with a person who has functional decline. So if you're relatively healthy and active, both physically and mentally, and you get pneumonia, you may only have decline related to your acute illness and once you've recovered from that, you're kind of back on your feet. If you have heart failure or you've had a stroke or maybe you have significant arthritis and you have dementia and now you become acutely ill with a pneumonia, you have so many strikes against you in terms of being able to kind of get back on your feet because your physiologic reserve is so depressed that for that person you may decline really quickly and it may take a very long time to recover. In fact, many patients don't recover. Functional decline in the hospital actually has been studied in terms of how quickly that can occur. So a, an early study actually done, I believe, in the 80s by Hirsch and colleagues found that functional decline can start as early as day two of hospitalization. I think for um, medically ill people, it's difficult to say when that occurs because it's very common for an older person who has a medical illness to be kind of harboring that illness before they come to the hospital. So we, we often, uh, in research for medically ill people and functional decline, look at that two weeks prior to actually being admitted to the hospital as their baseline functional status. So that's when we often start to see that patients are declining is they've either they report or their family or their caregivers 
report, oh, I've just really not had the same amount of energy, I can't leave the house, or, you know, my mother is not getting out of bed um, like she used to, and we can often pinpoint that to about two weeks prior to admission. So we know that somewhere between two weeks and being admitted to the hospital is when a lot of decline has already taken place. So when they come to the hospital and we see them for the first time as, as health care workers, um, they have already suffered a significant amount of decline. The implications of functional decline can be many. Um, it is, can contribute to morbidity and mortality. So someone who's, let's say, marginally functional at home, comes into the hospital, now becomes almost completely impaired from a mobility perspective or the ability to do their activities of daily living uh, and never returns to baseline. So that has many implications. Um, it can certainly lead to not being able to go back home again and live the same way in the same independent fashion that they have. It actually may mean that they can no longer return home, period. Um, if someone can't afford to hire help in the home, they may actually have to go to institutional living and that may be the end of their independent living um, in their own home. Um, certainly being less active physically has been shown to impair cognition. Um, it can lead to other things like, you know, over time diabetes, cardiovascular disease, um, just from disuse and, and um, you know, being immobile for a long time. Just thinking about patients who are not mobile uh, can have contractures, so they may actually not be able to have range of motion again. So it can be something as simple as needing to have a little bit of physical therapy in the outpatient setting to actually being significantly impaired. You know, I hear from uh, my nurse colleagues, and I've certainly kept up on the literature about, um, you know, nurses saying that they don't have time to mobilize patients. I often talk to colleagues and have seen some studies that have shown that nurses sometimes believe that mobilizing is the purview of physical therapy and occupational therapy, but it's actually not. I mean, nursing is really the group of professionals. We're the ones that are with the patients 24 hours a day, so we should be, if not facilitating it, we should be partnering with our rehab PT and OT um, partners to develop a plan to keep a patient active. So it can be something as simple as doing range of motion on a patient who may need to be on bed rest, let's say, the rare occasions that people do need to be on bed rest, um, range of motion, keeping people active even if it's with their upper body. We have a lot of assistive technology these days, so we have minimal lift equipment, we have chairs that are neuro chairs where a patient doesn't have to bear weight. We can actually safely for our back slide them into it. The patient can sit up. Uh, so there's a lot more that we can do now that doesn't require the patient actually having to physically be able to get out of bed. So for those patients who can't do that, that's one thing we can do. The other thing is um, it's very comfortable often for older people, especially if they have any degree of cognitive impairment, so let's say maybe they have Alzheimer's disease, to have a routine. So to talk to families and caregivers about our patients' routines and trying to stick to those as much as possible. So if they rise at 8, can we let them rise at 8? Um, if they like to, you know, toilet and then have, you know, a cup of coffee. So maintaining a routine, which includes activity. Um, Things like letting the patient do as much for themselves as they can. I think we're all very pressed for time, and often it's easier to feed someone who's maybe having a little bit of difficulty instead of letting them feed themselves with us queuing and standing by, obviously, for safety. But, you know, if we, if we continue to do all of those things for people, those patients that are really on the edge of losing function may lose it altogether even dur during a short stay. Uh, other routines like toileting, um, so rather than having a patient use a bedpan or wear a brief, let's say, that yes, it does take more time to have them get up and toilet, but can we use a bedside commode? When I talk about partnering, can we split up 
ambulating patients. So can a physical therapist do it once a day, a nurse can do it once a day, a nursing assistant do it once a day, maybe family do it once a day? Is there any way we can kind of share that load? Keeping people active with things like reading the newspaper, visiting with volunteers, having crafts to do, animal-assisted therapy, whatever kind of keeps a person stimulated may make them feel more like staying active. Certainly, um, from a nursing perspective, questioning bed rest orders. So there's almost no reason why someone needs to be on bed rest, and even if they do, it should really be just for a very short period of time. So even people that have orthopedic surgery, people that have um, myocardial infarctions, people that have tests and procedures that are invasive. Nowadays, we have really been able to limit the amount of time that people need to be on bed rest. So anytime we see that order, we should be questioning it. Why? Contacting the physician to get those orders overturned. Um, other things, I think, would be to communicate to patients and families why it's really important to stay active. We, we try and have a mobility plan for patients, so we actually have a mobility care plan that we post in the patient rooms on the whiteboard so that anyone who enters the room can see, oh, Mrs. Smith can get out of bed with one person assist, um, and they use the commode, etc. so that if I'm just walking into a patient's room and the patient says I need to go to the bathroom, I can look at that and say, oh, I can do this. I don't need to wait for another person. I don't need to get um, any assistive equipment. I think reviewing a patient's medications and labs. So if they're really anemic, if they have electrolyte Im imbalances, if they're dehydrated, to have a discussion as part of the team that this may be contributing to their fatigue or they're not really being motivated um, to get going. So I think there's a lot we can do. If we think that we have to do all of it, though, I can understand why it seems really overwhelming. The hospital admission risk profile is a fairly new uh, screening instrument. It was developed in the 1990s, and it hasn't really been uh, studied much in other patient populations. So the original goal of the HARP assessment instrument was to have an instrument that can help identify patients at admission who may lose function during a hospital stay, specifically activity of daily living function. So that would be things like feeding, bathing, toileting, transferring. So those really basic activities that we need in order to be able to survive. So this instrument stratifies patients based on their questions at low, medium, or high risk to lose ADLs. So we do it close to admission, and that way we have some idea early on, is this person at intermediate, let's say, to high risk for losing function? And we would definitely want to communicate that right away so that we can get a plan in place. The hospital admission risk profile, or HARP, has three different parameters that we use to come up with the final score. So the first is age, and that's pretty straightforward. We know patients age when they come in. The second is there's a cognitive piece to it. So we actually ask some questions about orientation as well as ability to recall and some attention questions, and a person is scored on that. The third piece is the uh, instrumental activities of daily living that a person, uh, ha their ability um, with their IDLs at the time of admission. So those are the three domains, if you will, that go into the HARP, and then uh, based on that, a final score is obtained, which would stratify the person as being low, medium, or high risk for ADL loss. The HARP is pretty new, and it has been, was originally developed and tested using an acutely ill medical population. So as with any research, the authors give the caveat that they can't say it's generalizable to a wide swath of older patients because it hasn't formally been studied. However, from my perspective as a clinician, you could use the assessment instrument on surgical patients. The actual original authors say it could be a prognostic tool in an outpatient setting, 
in the emergency department when you're just wanting to get a snapshot of how this person is doing. Again, when we talk about functional decline and function in general, I think the research clearly demonstrates that it's a very dynamic process. People come in and out of being able to climb stairs, walk, do their activities of daily living um, across time. Having a baseline of what a person's HARP, let's say HARP score is, can help, especially if someone comes into the emergency room and they're going to be discharged right back to home. Knowing, you know, having some information about what we might anticipate based on that score I think would be really helpful because we can send someone home from the emergency department with services just like we do from an inpatient perspective. So if I saw someone in the emergency department and they were at high risk for loss of ADLs, I might want to think about getting them hooked up with home health at least to have a home safety eval to have a nurse or a physical therapist go into the home and do a basic home safety evaluation. The HARP was designed to be done as close to admission as possible because it stratifies a patient for loss of ADLs during the hospital stay. So it doesn't really make sense to do it three days into admission or at the time of discharge. Clearly if patients come in and they're altered and they can't do it, doing it as close to admission as possible is how the tool was designed. Certainly patients that are acutely ill may not be physically up to having that long of a conversation. Um, so fatigue comes into play, shortness of breath, you know, acuity of illness. Uh, so some patients may actually not be able to complete it all in one setting. We like to give the patient the admission assessment to complete kind of over the course of that first eight hours to 24 hours in acute care when they're uh, in the hospital to complete as much of it as they can. And what they can't complete, we will have to get collaterally from other people, family member, caregiver. Sometimes it does require the nurse sitting down and asking the patient questions and filling it out for them if they can't actually hold a pen or do it themselves. You know, language is also an issue that you would need to have someone who could translate. I think, as always, when we've talked about other functional assessment instruments throughout the course of the series, there's always the question of, you know, does the patient want to provide accurate information because of fear that their living situation will change? In this case, they would have to provide information on their instrumental activities of daily living. Always when you do cognitive screening, there's a lot of pressure on people to, you know, want to have the right answer, to do it quickly. So giving the patient time, I think encouraging them, um, you know, certainly not providing the answers for them, but, you know, making sure that they're still doing okay, that they're not feeling too stressed out by it. I mean, it's hard to answer some of those questions. It's hard to spell backwards and, you know, those kinds of things, and especially when you're feeling sick and you know that there may be a lot riding on it, you definitely want to give people time. Uh, always explaining, you know, why are we doing this assessment? You know, we want to do the assessment because it will help us understand how to best plan for you when it's time for you to go home. We want to know as early as possible when you come into the hospital that you may be at risk to lose function, and we don't want that to happen. So I think always providing the reason why you're doing it is really helps to kind of make a person feel like there's a reason why they're asking me these questions, and hopefully that will help them participate. You know, same with families, making sure families understand the reason why we're doing this. For those who are interested in more information, there's a couple of places that I w would recommend going. First of all, the American Journal of Nursing has been doing a series now for some time. It's many different assessment instruments, including other instruments that will help the bedside nurse gather information about functional status. So the segment on the CATS ADLs, the Lawton IADLs, as well as other cognitive screening tools that are available. All of those help the nurse get a big picture of what's going on with the patient. Uh, there's also the websites that are um, uh, through the Hartford Center, so consult JerryRN. 
Uh, I actually use that site. There's an excellent segment under resources about function that Dr. Kresovic has put together, and there's a lot of information about how to make a care plan to prevent functional decline, so many more interventions than we had time to talk about today. Um, so I would definitely recommend that. Also that um, Dr. Kresovic's section on function talks about how to move an organization forward. So what are some of the things, the expected outcomes that we would see if a hospital put emphasis on how important functional status is? I mean, I, I think I would say in closing that it's disappointing that more regulatory agencies or quality agencies don't put more stake in whether a person who is walking when they come to the hospital is actually walking, can walk when they leave the hospital. There's a lot of attention these days on things like ventilator-associated pneumonias and urinary tract infections and pressure ulcers, and all of those are very important, I would agree. But I think it also begs the question if someone has functional decline that could likely be prevented while they're in the hospital, that that should be a, a quality indicator that hospitals are benchmarked against.